However, one thing that we cannot evade, something we cannot avoid, something we cannot escape, and that's temptation. Uh, it is a surprise sometimes to new Christians to find that temptation is still there. In some cases, it's maybe intensified once you become a Christian. You know, there will always be temptation. The scripture is very clear in that. There will always be temptation. As long as Satan is loose in the world. And as I sort of alluded to a few moments ago, he works overtime. He works overtime to make Christians give in to temptation. We all know of those circumstances where you had that super Christian, might have been a TV evangelist or whatever, whatever, a super Christian, and all of a sudden we see them stumble and fall. And in amazement we say, why? Now, how could it be? Well, Bill Lee Graham once said, he wrote this, every one of us is tempted. There is no sin in being tempted. Let me repeat that one. There is no sin in being tempted. And we're going to come to it in a few moments because you have it printed in your bulletin, that passage from Matthew. You know, Jesus was tempted. The sin is, as Billy Graham wrote, the sin is when you use that temptation as an excuse for giving into it. With that, turn in your bulletins to that passage that we have from uh, Matthew, because we're going to sort of dissect that in a few moments here. But as we look at this passage, Jesus is tempted in several different ways. And I'm going to come back to these. The appetite, self-reason, and the ego. And the first one there, as we look at it, the tempter being Satan, Satan uh, said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now in the context of this, this follows the 40 days in the wilderness where he was fasting. He was hungry. I don't know if you've ever fasted. Sometimes, you know, we have a 24 hour or 48 hour fast and we think we're really starving. But can you imagine what it's like if you really are fasting for roughly 40 days? And that was Jesus. And here's the tempter saying, you know, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. That was the first of the temptation. We're going to come back to some of this in a few moments. Then he took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple. In other words, a very high place. And he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Jump off this pinnacle. That deals with self-reason. In some of the areas where that affects us today, it could be drugs. It could be anything that we're tempted to do that's going to injure our bodies. For me, if I eat too much of hot, buttered, salty popcorn, uh, that is going to affect me at some point, isn't it? And same way if we don't watch our diets and all that, you know, and we gorge ourselves beyond what we should be eating. That could be part of the self-reason. But think of all the ways in our society today that people are injuring themselves because of self-reason. You know, they know better, at least on one level, they should know better. But for whatever reason, they allow the temptation to win out on them. And then we get to the final one. Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. That deals with the ego, our values. And look at the many ways that we're tempted by television and advertising and so forth to buy beyond our means to do things that we shouldn't be doing. You're part of that ego that we have. And yet, as we look at this, you know, and let's go back to uh, the one dealing with turning the stones into loaves of bread. Jesus didn't need that. He had a spiritual nourishment that he was receiving. And as you'll notice, in every one of these, his defense was the word of God. So when he was tempted by Satan, he turned to the word of God. And he answered that first one. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then for the second one, that self-reason one, uh, throwing yourself off the temple. You know. And he first of all quoted scripture, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And then again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
turning again to Scripture. And then finally, this one that's dealing with the ego, that, oh, he can have all these kingdoms. All these kingdoms are his already. But Satan is trying to tempt him in other ways. I guess maybe that he could be a Roman ruler or something like that and, and ruling the Roman Empire. But again, quoting scripture, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited upon him. And the other important thing that he said here was Satan, be gone. Away with me, Satan. Now, how do you know if the temptation is from God or Satan? Well, very simple. And let's go back to that passage from James. The passage that was read from James. Uh, blessed is anyone who endures temptation. We're all tempted, okay? So blessed are we when we're able to overcome those temptations. Such as one who stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord <laughs> excuse me, has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. So no temptation is from God. He will put us to the test. He will put us to the trial, but it's only Satan who ultimately tempts us. Another way of saying this is that God will never put before us a trial or a test that will lead to sin. And there's only one source of sin, and that's Satan. I'm not going to do a survey, but you know, we could even do a survey at this point. How many even believe that there is that physical force, that spiritual force out there called Satan? And yet it's a reality. The Bible confirms it. This passage from Matthew confirms it because Jesus himself was tempted by Satan. He tempts us in those areas of personality not yet under full control of the Holy Spirit. Satan knows our weaknesses. And so whether it's drink, whether it's smoke, whether it's sex, whatever it might be, he knows where we're going to give in to temptations. And his tempting is a clear demonstration of who really has control of our lives. Is it Satan or is it God? To find an area in life which you repeatedly fall into temptation, it is because maybe of old passions, especially those who had uh, succumbed to drink. Uh, anybody who was ever an alcoholic knows the difficulty for them in order to stay away from being enticed, from being tempted. You can say the same thing for any of the vices in our lives, that once we give in, he has hold of us. Again, it's because of our old passions, it's because of our old natures, it's because of our old desires that these hold control rather than Jesus Christ in his ever-present spirit. Go back to, uh, on the other side of that sheet that you have there, the hymn that we're going to be singing at the close of the service, say, Yield Not to Temptation. I love this hymn, it's an old one, you don't find it in a lot of uh, our hymn, I know it's not in our hymn book, Yield not temptation, for yielding is sin. Again, being tempted is not sin. It, <coughs> excuse me, it's giving in to the sin that becomes, uh, giving in to that temptation becomes a sin. Okay, each victory will help you, some others, to win. Fight manly onward. Dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. Okay, so the first part, yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. The second verse, shun evil companions, bad language disdain. In other words, if we're tempted in certain areas of life, uh, and let's say we, we used to go with a whole group of people that uh, wanted to go out drinking every night and we're having a drinking problem, you think we should be hanging around with that group of people? No. Because they're leading us into temptation. And we could say the same thing about you know, other areas of our lives that lead us into sin. Okay, shun evil companions, bad language and stain, God's name hold reverence, nor take in vain. And then the third one, to him that overcometh, to the person that overcometh, God giveth the crown. Though faith we shall conquer, though they often cast down. He who is our savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Yield not 
to temptation. In another way, and this isn't one of the passages you had there, but it's, it's one that I like very much, and it's found back in the uh, sixth chapter, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And this particular one has to do with the armor of God. That one of the ways that we can sort of control and over, uh, have victory over our temptations is this passage from Ephesians, the sixth chapter. It's called the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. In other words, the devil's temptations. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. In plain words, our our adversary is out there. Satan, uh, the evil one, whatever we want to call him, the devil, uh, he's the one that... uh, tries to get us to give in to temptation. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, when the day of evil comes, in other words, when Satan is really trying to tempt us, when the day of evil comes, and I lost my place here. Okay, Uh, take firm stand when the belt of, okay. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all these, take up the shield of faith, in which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. Let me just single out two of those. One, it talks about the sword. And we have quite a few references in the uh, Bible about the sword. And the sword in those days was both an offensive and a defensive weapon. Uh, The sword back then usually had a sharp edge on both edges, not just one. We think of a sword, you know, with just one side. But back then it was two edges. And so no matter which way you were swinging that sword, you had an offensive, defensive weapon that uh, God has given us. And in every case, whenever it talks about the sword, it's talking about the word of God. That the word of God is a two-edged sword. It helps in our defense. It helps to protect us so that we know when the tempter and what the tempter is trying to do in our lives. And then the last part of that it comes back to this whole area of prayer. Of prayer. In your bulletins, and it's the page right after the last page for the worship service today, I have there printed, Helps for Overcoming Temptation. So let's just look at those for a few moments here. Helps for Overcoming Temptations. For one thing, it goes back to this passage from Matthew. Matthew. And you have that before you. I'm not going to repeat it. We just went through that. Uh, Jesus met, and so can you, and so can I, meet the tempter, Satan, the devil, the evil one, whatever we're going to call him, uh, with the two-edged sword, the word of God. And the second one there, there is a suggestion from a non-theologian, Thomas Edison. I'm not bothered with temptation. I'm too busy. And that's a good one, okay? If you keep busy, especially if you keep busy with the things of God, then you're not going to be tempted to do these things that are not of God. And the fourth one, like Jesus, you can say, away from me, Satan. Be gone, Satan. You know, whenever you are tempted in ways that you know are not Christian, are not scripturally, are not good, then simply say, away from me, Satan. And finally, pray. And especially as we pray something in the Lord's Prayer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That simple prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And a little translation of that is, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from Satan. Deliver us from 
uh, the devil, whatever we want to call him, but deliver us from evil. If you have those tools, then those times that you're tempted, and you will be, and we are, uh, you at least have those defensive mechanisms at your disposal. Let us pray.